there is something going on. But it is not what we think is going on. <clears throat> We're getting in these verses of the Lankavitara Sutra a very profound teaching. And it's not a teaching which I've ever heard any spiritual teacher or other authority speak of. Which is quite peculiar really. Because it's so fundamental to the wisdom teachings of India and China. And I first recognized this teaching in the series of videos I did on the Yoga Vasishta. And this teaching can be very simply stated. But I'm rather hesitant to say what this teaching is because it will be immediately dismissed by anybody tuning into this video who's not seen any of my previous videos. But I have to just put up with that and boldly state that the world does not exist. The world does not exist. This teaching is only for the Enlightenment practitioner, what is described in Buddhism as the Bodhisattva. It is not a teaching for conventional understanding. Conventionally, even the Enlightenment practitioner continues to behave as if the world exists, unless your path is of traditional yoga or meditation, and you have the option of spending most of your time in meditative absorption. Otherwise, you just get on with things. I should probably say more about that at another point. But let's just stay with the teaching for the time being. The world does not exist. As I said, there are things going on. There are things which we normally describe as sensory perceptions, as visual forms. There's things apparent to what we call the sense of sight. And there are sounds, taste, touch, smells, and there's also feelings and thoughts. All these things are going on. I'm just going to backtrack a little bit to verse 124 before moving on. What is seen as multiplicity is the mind saturated with the forms of evil habits. Because of mental delusions, one clings to forms and appearances regarding them as objective realities. So it's this belief in an objective reality which is at fault. We take everything that is going on as a manifestation of an objective reality. And what we're being told here is that it isn't. And we shouldn't take it as such. That we only take it as such because of evil habits. These evil habits are the habits of conventional understanding embedded in us through education but also as embedded in us through our moods. We have characteristic ways of seeing the world not only in terms of the particular culture that we live in but in terms of our own moods. 
So these are the two things we have to deal with. Now just to reinforce this point, I want to read from the main text of the Sutra. I'm going to read from the last paragraph before section 7 of chapter 2, which is on page 36 of the translation. The Buddha is talking to Mahamati. Again, Mahamati, my teaching consists in the cessation of sufferings arising from the discrimination of the triple world, in the cessation of ignorance, desire, deed and causality, and in the recognition that an objective world, like a vision, is the manifestation of mind itself. So this thing that I said is going on is described here as mind with a capital M. In the previous paragraph, the Buddha talks about the erroneous teachings of the philosophers and that their error lies in that they do not recognize an objective world to be of mind itself. And this mind itself is erroneously discriminated and this discrimination means taking bits of it, taking bits of what's going on and assuming that that bit has got an independent reality that there's that it's made up of something it has some intrinsic parts if it's a person we might think that that person has some kind of soul if it's an object then we think in terms of uh, reality based on subatomic particles or whatever and so we give it this underlying reality quite different to the reality that we're directly experiencing. So this is discrimination. So this objective world, this so-called objective world, is actually nothing more than mind itself. What is this mind? Mind is awareness. is that by which we are aware of the so-called objective world. It's like the consciousness of the dreamer. The consciousness of the dreamer is the dream. The dream is no different from the awareness of the dreamer. But in the same way, the objective world is no different from that which is aware of it. This sounds all a bit intellectual perhaps, a bit abstract. On a practical level, what it means is we come back to our own sense of being. We come back to a sense of completeness. and we realize that there is nothing in this so-called objective world that we need to complete our sense of being. It's only because we believe that the world is something objective and separate from us that we feel incomplete. And that belief is erroneous. So this isn't just about a belief, an intellectual reshaping. The teaching that the world does not exist, that objective reality is not objective, should have the direct result of bringing us back to the fullness of our sense of being. Failing to do this is the cause of suffering. The 
Buddha's teaching is about the removal of suffering. And this suffering is actually our depleted sense of being. It's the sense of inner impoverishment. A sense that somehow we need to get something from out there. It might be riches, it might be fame. It might be good looks, whatever. These things are driven by an impoverished sense of being. It's suffering. The Buddha taught that the Eightfold Path is the way to the removal of suffering. You can follow the Eightfold Path till the cows come home. But if you still believe in the objective reality of the world, it's not going to make the slightest bit of difference. It's not going to make the slightest bit of difference. The Buddha says his teaching consists in the cessation of sufferings arising from the discrimination of the triple world. And that discrimination is the discrimination into supposedly objective entities out there. That's the cause of suffering. That's the cause of inner impoverishment. I'll say more about this discrimination in the next video.